process of identity formation in, in the 19th century um, in that region. Um, he's gone on to have uh, his book from 2017, Upriver Journeys, Diaspora and Empire in South China, 1570 to 1850, um, as well as Opportunity in Crisis, Cantonese Migrants and the State in Late Qing China, and then Chinese Diasporas, a Social History of Global Migration. Um, perhaps related to that is his really important article in the Cambridge History of Global Migrations called Urbanization and Emigration in Coastal South China. Um, so today I'm delighted to have Professor Miles here to speak to us on what I think is the beginning of a new book project. Um, and he's gonna to speak to us on the topic of wet and dry seasonality in a Southern Chinese city, 1820s to 1880s. So please join me in welcoming Professor Miles. Thank you, Professor Goldman, uh, for inviting me. I'm very happy uh, to be here. Uh, and I wanna thank you all uh, for this opportunity to discuss uh, a book project that has been simmering on the back burner for a very long time. Uh, having done research on the city of Guangzhou or Canton and its Pearl River Delta hinterland for many years, I've long been looking for an opportunity to write about what I think are some interesting events and more generally to explore the lived experience of urban residents. Uh, my, gen my initial idea was to focus on seasonality. So anything that might have a seasonal pattern, maybe birth, illness, and death, uh, the ritual cycle, the business cycle, uh, routine crime, extraordinary uh, social protests and such. And now I'm even thinking a bit more broadly in terms of just the rhythms of urban life, uh, the linking seasonality to the movement of people and goods in and out of the city. Uh, my concern is that I'm pursuing a self-indulgent project in search of an argument. Uh, is it enough to convey a sense of lived experience, to explain annual and seasonal patterns of life, to introduce the circumstances that brought people into the city and pushed them out of it? Uh, is it worth sharing a ton of information about Guangzhou if I don't explore the more general implications for understanding urban change in 19th century Chinese or even global cities? Uh, and would I be better off uh, turning this project into a digital humanities resource for undergraduate education instead of a research monograph? So these are questions. As, as I was forced to put my thoughts on paper for this presentation, these are some of the questions, or maybe we could even say doubts that I had. Uh, but for now, assuming that I do stick with the idea of a research monograph, uh, today I will discuss material for what I envision as the first two substantive chapters covering the most distinct form of seasonality, the wet and dry seasons, and the kinds of disasters associated with each season. Uh, in the interest of time, uh, I, today I will focus primarily on the wet season with just a few examples from the dry season. And I'm interested in, in both the routine and the eventful. That is both kind of the everyday run-of-the-mill seasonal uh, patterns and seasonal calamities. Um, but I guess if I'm uh, having to think about a larger argument, one might be that uh, the calamitous was becoming routine in the 19th century. In other words, 19th century observers kept commenting that the calamitous seemed to be becoming more and more common and more and more calamitous. So um, with that being said, let me proceed. Uh -oh. Why is that not going on there? If that works, that doesn't work. Okay, slides. <laughs> they worked five minutes ago, trust me. <laughs> oh, uh, the next slide, uh, fortunately, simply says navigating the city during wet season. Uh, so you're not missing much uh, by not seeing that slide. So at the risk of standing here as an old person, boring young people in the audience with talk about the weather, uh, I'm going to begin by trying to convey a sense of the routine lived experience during the wet season. 
Uh, unlike in northern cities, where the main seasonal rhythm was the alternation between frozen and thawed seasons, in southern cities, the basic pattern was the alternation of wet and dry seasons. Um, and this was dictated by the monsoon wind pattern. Uh, Guangzhou had an annual accumulation of nearly uh, 70 inches of rain. And if I understand correctly, here it's something more like 16 or 17 inches annually. So 70 inches is a lot of rain, comparatively speaking. Um, and most of that rain was concentrated in the period from around the second month in the lunar calendar to the eighth month. And so if we convert, that'd be late February, March, or early April to September through mid-October around there. Right? So uh, the rainy season appears in monthly reports uh, on weather conditions and agricultural productivity. So uh, the provincial officials in each province were to regularly every month submit these reports. And because provincial officials were based in Guangzhou, thank you very much. There you go. So you didn't miss much. By that, right? um, this, uh, I'm glad <laughs> it's working out. Um, so uh, monthly reports, right? So the provincial officials were based in Guangzhou. So they basically describe conditions in Guangzhou and then say, yeah, the other prefectures were pretty much like this. Or if there were any exceptions, they would say that. So I take their reports as primarily describing conditions in Guangzhou. Um, in my sample of such reports, uh, we can see that the memorialists employ some variation of the stock phrase that there were over 10 soaking rains across the three 10-day weeks of the month in question. Uh, this phrase is absent in reports on the 9th, 10th, and 11th months, and appears only once in the 12th month uh, with a slight variation of over 10 occasions of drizzle, right? So not, not heavy rain, right? So uh, this might not be quite scientific enough, but it gives you a sense of seasonality, right? The wet season versus the dry season. And in relation to this, I would just point out that uh, when Guangzhou-based officials reported on drought, they really only thought of a drought as being a drought when dry weather continued into the wet season, right? So, you know, uh, lack of rain in the, in the dry season is unexceptional, right? But in the wet season, it is. Right, another routine aspect of uh, the wet season was annual flooding caused by freshets from the West River and the North River, which converge west of Guangzhou and then split again into two channels that flow on either side of the Mulberry Garden Enclosure or the Song Yanwei Dike. Um, I made this map for another purpose using China Historical GIS. So I actually did not enable the North River. Uh, so if I had, you'd see a line here. So the North River comes from Northern Guangdong here, the West River from Guangxi through Western Guangdong. They meet here and then they kind of split up again. And the Song Yan Way or Mulberry Garden Enclosure protected this very fertile land in the center. And this, uh, most of this is uh, under the jurisdiction of Nanhai County. Uh, this little part right here is under the jurisdiction of Shunda County. So this silk producing and fish farming region of Nanhai and Shunda counties was the wealthiest part of Guangzhou's hinterland or the Pearl River Delta. So high waters from spring rains, both locally and especially upriver, would put stress on the Mulberry Garden enclosure and other dikes along the rivers. Uh, in monthly weather and agricultural reports from Guangzhou, freshets on the West River and North River might appear toward the end of the fourth month or as late as the seventh month, but they're really uh, concentrated in the fifth and sixth months. And memorialists would often present this information as explanation for breaching of dikes and damage to surrounding fields and homes, usually mainly or at least initially in the countryside. Uh, and then the waters would recede and they would report that they're conducting repairs during the dry season, right? So the freshets usually are mainly a problem in the hinterland, not so much in the city, which is kind of connected to the Western North Rivers via a complex system of uh, distributaries and canals. And uh, Guangzhou City up here, right? you can see it's some removed. Uh, Guangzhou City was built to accommodate the rainy season. Uh, in paved streets, rain drained through the spaces between granite slabs into small drains along the streets, 
And within the walled city, in turn floated into a complex web of larger drains, conventionally known as the six arterial drains. These drains flowed into moats that roughly followed the contours of the walls of the old city, and by the 19th century were collectively known as the Jade Belt River. Um, this map of the six arterial drains uh, was made after a 19th century dredging project, a late 19th century dredging project. Uh, this image is drawn to highlight the waterways, and so it might be a bit exaggerated, but it gives us a good sense of how uh, the waterways in the city were closely integrated with the Pearl River. Right? So the Pearl River is here. This is the new walled city. This is the old walled city here. And uh, how many arterial drains there were varied by time and the person counting them, but the most conventional is six. So you have one, two, three, four, uh, five, and six, right, arterial drains. Uh, the moats follow the contours of the city wall, basically, and ultimately flow into the Pearl River. Um, the arterial drains and moats were important for channeling sewage out of the city and for draining rainwater so that washed down Yesho Hill on the north side of the city, right? So uh, this is Yesho Hill here. Uh, the northern city wall actually goes over the hill, right? So water drained from the hill down into the city, basically. Right? And we'll see uh, that playing a role in a flood in a moment. Uh, so uh, this is the old city here. This is the new city. Not on this map is the flourishing commercial western suburb known as Xiguan. Uh, so here you can see the very western tip of the new city, western tip of the old city, and this is Xiguan here, right? And maybe a little hard to see, but it has its own system of drains or canals that lead to the Pearl River as well, right? The moats, at least, were also thoroughfares to traffic, especially during high tides. So I'm not quite sure precisely where this is. I think it's the western moat sort of separating Xiguan, the western suburb, from the walled city. And you can see, at least in high tide, a lot of boats on it, right? So uh, foreign observers would always call this a water street, right? Give you a sense that, you know, there's a lot of traffic and it basically functioned as a street. If walking the paved streets, um, one could see the complexion of the city change with the seasons, right? So on the left, uh, temporary watchtowers were built on bamboo poles high above the roofs of houses, and they served as a warning system for fires during winter. In spring and summer, on the right, uh, street coverings offered some protection from uh, rain and sun, so you can see. And from the caps I've seen, it seems like these are not permanent fixtures, right? They kind of more towers were erected for winter season, more of this covering was erected for the spring and summer, right? So the, the visage of the city changes, right? In the rainy season, moving about the city could be hazardous. The granite paved streets became slippery on rainy or even just humid days, uh, even though the granite slabs were, according to one observer, cut roughly on the surface to prevent slipping. Uh, they're still slippery, speaking from personal experience. Uh, after torrential rains, unpaved areas, such as the execution ground in the southern suburb, turned to puddles and mud. But local residents of the city seemed to take the wet season in stride. So in dealing with rain, uh, the top account here in English um, is written by a British observer in 1877, and it resonates with the passage on the bottom, uh, written by the son of a wealthy early 19th century pond merchant, uh, about his father. And basically they're both, both conveying the idea that elite men, when it rains heavily, they just take their nice embroidered silken shoes off and walk in order to prevent their shoes from getting wet or at least dirty, right? So the locals just kind of adapt, right? Uh, likewise, in dealing with humidity, right? Uh, drying books and artwork in the sun was a common practice, but very difficult at time, right? You had to find a day uh, when it was sunny. It's kind of like drying clothes as well in Hong Kong uh, in the wet season. Uh, we see the practice reflected in a dictionary entry on the top, right? This is a Cantonese dictionary, uh, Cantonese English. Uh, we see this reflected uh, in a diary. Uh, so the early 19th century literatus Xiu Lan Zhong uh, just notes that one day he uh, had his servants presumably uh, sort of lay out 
his books and paintings uh, in his collection to be dried. And then it became part of the ritual cycle at the uh, renowned Confucian Academy, the Shuaikong, right? So uh, in the ritual cycle of the Academy, um, right? So the uh, refined gatherings of the Academy, uh, one of those happens in high summer or the fifth lunar month, right? Uh, you sort of uh, gather, uh, bring the books out from the Academy and display them. Uh, the Academy is on the slope of the mountain. So you just sort of display them in the sun and use this as a time for uh, learning and exchange, right? So um, locals dealt with the rain and the humidity. Uh, that said, sudden heavy rains in the wet season did shape the pace of life in and around the city, often putting plans on hold. Uh, heavy rain as impediment uh, often appears in diaries. Uh, I'll just give you one example or a couple of examples from one uh, diary uh, by Liang Qi, a young literatus and resident of Xiguan. Um, he expressed resentment in 1861 when rain disrupted plant outings on three festival days in the second month, the third month, and the fourth month, right? Um, so locals would express exasperation, right? Uh, but when they did so, they're kind of taking it in stride and they're, they're emphasizing unusual times, right? Rather than unusual places. Heavy rains in the wet season also created hazards. Uh, in 1884, in the middle of the sixth month, the Shanghai-based newspaper Shanbao reported that a torrential drought downpour drove pedestrians on one street in Xiguan into a restaurant to seek shelter. There then was a loud crash, uh, the sound of the kitchen crumbling after being struck by heavy rain. And this in turn created a panic in which pedestrians fell from the stairs from the second floor down to the first floor. You know, people wrote about, or people in the city wrote about the damp, rainy, hot weather of the wet season in different ways. Right? So locals commented on unusually long stretches of cloudy or rainy weather and basically left it at that. So I give um, examples from the top two examples, Wen Ting Chu. Uh, he's from Jiangxi province, but he's a long-term resident of um, uh, Guangzhou in his formative years or in Guangzhou. Uh, and then Wang Chan is the uh, son of a migrant, a migrant from Zhejiang province, right? Uh, and so in uh, one's diary entry, he says, you know, uh, I saw the moon and it's been 50 days since I've seen the moon, right? It's just been cloudy for 50 days, right? Uh, Wang Chan in a long annotation, well, by Qing terms, this is actually a short annotation to a poem, uh, says that, you know, from uh, the beginning of the year, so now it's been four months and there's only been some 10 odd days for the whole day, we don't have any rain, right? Um, so local residents would comment on uh, long stretches of time uh, of you know, rainy or cloudy weather. Visitors to the city found the hot, humid and rainy weather in the wet season, both uncomfortable and unfathomable. Uh, an example I give is Guo Song Tao, a Hunan native, who served as Guangdong governor. The weather during his first spring and summer in 1864 was in fact unusually rainy, prompting editors of the Guangzhou Prefectural Gazetteer to note that there was much rain from the first to the fifth months. For the outsider Guo Song Tao, however, the incessant rain confirmed the unusual nature of the place where he was serving as governor. In the middle of the fourth month, after days of ceaseless rain, Guo laments in his diary that he's more fish than man. Uh, one day in the middle of the seventh month, apprehensive after heavy rains that overturned basins and continued day and night without end, Go observed that from the first month up until then, uh, there was hardly a single day without rain, a phenomenon that this man in his 40s first experienced during his first year in Guangdong, right? In the following summer, after a long drought, right, so we had too much rain one year, drought the next year, Guo speculated that the odd weather could only be attributed to Guai Qi, right? So kind of you know, strange errors. And finally, he compared the unfathomable weather of Guangdong with the inscrutable Cantonese people, right? So this outsider from Hunan um, associates long stretches of uh, odd, unusual weather with the place rather than with the times. Okay. Um, enough of weather in the routine sense. Let me move to uh, catastrophes. 
right? Uh, beginning with floods. Uh, the wet and dry seasons both had their characteristic disasters, right? Floods and windstorms in the wet season, fires in the dry season. Uh, and in this sense, Guangzhou was like many other East Asian cities, subject to the monsoon pattern. Uh, newspaper reports uh, from the late 19th century convey a sense of a fire season concentrated in a five month period, the ninth month through the first month. So roughly October through February, right? Uh, floods and storms in the wet season, like fires in the dry season, were both part of regular patterns of seasons and were momentous events that briefly removed social controls, revealed agendas and biases of, of observers, and provided opportunities to reshape the urban landscape. And like fires, flooding was perceived as getting worse, as reaching a crisis point in the early 19th century. In this period, for example, annual freshets and specific floods became a common theme in the poetry of Cantonese literati. And perhaps someday we'll find if uh, the same thing happened in Yeo or not, who knows. Um, some extraordinary floods affected not only communities along the West River, but also urban Guangzhou lying on the Pearl River, which as I said, was linked to the West and North Rivers via a complex system of distributaries. The increasing toll of floods and fires on urban residents and infrastructure was surely linked to growth, and maybe we could even say overgrowth of the city. And flood disasters in the 19th century in particular were probably a culmination of the ecological breakdown that Robert Marx has written about. The most devastating urban flood in the early 19th century, Guangzhou, occurred in 1833, after freshets in the fifth month had damaged West River dikes. Uh, so initially, it's a problem as usual for the rural hinterland, right, along the West River. But in the seventh month, high waters uh, in the river combined with heavy wind and rain to affect Guangzhou directly. As the Governor General Lu Kun and the Governor of Guangdong reported, streets and cities and streets in the city and suburbs were flooded for days. Most severe was the area around the east and north gate where water was as high as three or four chur, so let's say maybe, maybe around four feet. The force of the water prevented city gates from being closed while residents used boats to move around the city. Uh, the governor general and governor reported over 4,000 gen or bays of officials and commoners homes had toppled. Now the east and north gates uh, receiving the greatest damage seems counterintuitive, right? So the east gate, is on the Don River side of the Pearl River Delta. So you would think if, if freshets coming down the rivers from the West River uh, caused flooding, they would hit the West Gate, not the East Gate. And the North Gate is on the inland side of the city, right? The Pearl River Delta is here and the North Gate is here. So why flooding in these places, right? Um, but heavy rains in Guangzhou, as I pointed out earlier, wash down from the mountain into the city, right? Um, so that's one factor. Also, riverine floods in the city were not so much a matter of water coming over the dikes, uh, but rather uh, floodwaters and tide waters coming into the walled city through the system of moats and drains that was designed to flush rain and wastewaters out of the city, right? So the very system designed to keep the city dry and flat made it wet, right? Uh, particularly hard hit by the 1833 flood were low-lying areas uh, such as uh, the north end of Guantanjie, uh, just south of the water gate in the North City Wall, right? So, uh, right, so basically we're, we're looking at a detail of this area here, right, so northwest part of the walled city. Uh, this is from an 1860 map produced by an American missionary. Uh, this is from a map in the uh, 1870s, 80s produced for the uh, uh, gazetteer of the Banner Garrison. Um, this street, Guantan Jia, uh, lay within Guangzhou's Banner Garrison of some 30,000 Manchu and Han Jun soldiers and family members in the western third of the old city. Unlike in most places, uh, this Banner Garrison was not separately walled off, but it was distinct enough for the rest of the city 
that officials reported on it separately. Uh, and I'll just point out the reason I have two maps here. Uh, this one shows the Western moat, but not the Watergate. <laughs> uh, this one does not show the moat, but it shows the Chiguan, the Watergate here, right? So if this map had depicted it, it would be right around there, just north of Guantanamo, yes, right? All right. Uh, so the garrison general and uh, the garrison general Hafeng up and the governor general Lu Kun explained in a separate memorial on flooding in the banner section uh, that the banner garrison occupied low lying land in the northwest corner of the city. And when water backed up via the moats into the drains, the water gates could not drain them quickly enough. Another factor might have been that the walls of homes in the banner quarter were typically constructed of mud rather than. Uh, bricks, as for most homes of at least middling and upper class people you know, elsewhere in the city. Hafonga and Lu explain that there were a total of 9,350 bays of bingfang, which I'm um, still trying to figure out if I want to translate that as barracks or homes. Um, and depending upon the rank or category, our bannerman might have two or three bays assigned to him and his family. Uh, Hafonga and Lu reported that over 3,800 20 bays of these bingfang had collapsed in the rain, wind, and flood. And over 5,000 bays of the bingfang were severely damaged, but temporarily reinforced with wooden scaffolding, still livable. A year after the flood, Lu Kun reported that 1,245 bays of the damaged bingfang had since collapsed, right? So the 1833 flood seems to have just devastated um, the infrastructure of the Banner Quarter. Uh, of the city, um, probably not being the first cause of the decline of the batter quarter, but certainly feeding into uh, a process that I think was probably already in play. Uh, and keep in mind, this is you know this is where the elite units of the Qing army are stationed in Guangzhou, right? And this is the uh, part of the city that's uh, least resistant to permanent flood damage, you could say. So if the 1833 flood accelerated decline of the Banner Quarter, it also drove the formation of gentry managed institutions elsewhere in the city. The flood created a large homeless population that would soon face the possibility of famine. Uh, provincial officials temporarily housed the city's refugees in temples and distributed rice gruel uh, to sustain the homeless population. Uh, relief funds for poor people who had lost their homes distributed beginning in the early 12th month were minimal and the application process was cumbersome. In its February 1834 issue, the English language Canton based journal Chinese Repository reported that, quote, uh, great numbers of the poor who were rendered houseless and penniless by the inundation last August have perished during the winter. Two months later, the journal estimated at least 5,000 beggars in the city, a number that they said, the journal editor said was, uh, were swollen by victims of the previous year's flood. Though not enough for these hapless victims, uh, relief efforts in the aftermath of the 1833 flood resulted in institutional innovation. Uh, accounts of the origins of the Kind Relief Charitable Granary on West Lake Street trace them to the 1833 flood. So, here we see kind of the, the southern half of the old walled city uh, in part of the new city, and uh, West Lake Street is right here. So uh, Banner Garrison is in the western third of the old city. The rest is from the general population, right? So we have dilapidation here, institutional innovation here, right? Um, and this is uh, primarily a gentry-led uh, institution. Right. Uh, most accounts portray the granary as the kind of institutionalization of ad hoc relief efforts after the flood. Uh, the, granary, the granary began formal operation in 1837 and henceforth became arguably the most important gentry managed institution in the city. So once again, um, I wouldn't say that the 1833 flood caused uh, the emergence of gentry led uh, charitable institutions in the city. And I wouldn't say it caused the decline of the Banner Quarter, but it certainly fed into those two uh, developments. Mm -hmm. 
In the late 19th century, new sources, uh, especially Chinese language newspapers, provide more details, often sensationalized, about seasonal disasters like floods, windstorms, and fires. Uh, I draw heavily on the Shanghai-based Shanbao and the Hong Kong-based Tsun Bo, uh, especially the latter's regular news from Guangzhou feature. Uh, in reporting on a major flood in 1885, attention of this new medium of Chinese language newspapers focused on Xiguan, uh, the western suburb. Problems began with heavy wind and rain at the Duanwu Festival, so the fifth day of the fifth month. Uh, especially bad flooding in Xiguan resulted from continuing heavy rains in following days, combined with high river levels from seasonal freshets and exacerbated at high tide when the Pearl River actually flows from downriver to upriver, right? Um, it's kind of hard for me to wrap my head around that until I took a ferry across the river and lo and behold, <laughs> the water's going that way when it's supposed to be going that way, right? So the tides do make a difference. Um, so uh, Sun Wan Ya Bo uh, reported uh, residents retreating to upper stories and those without such recourse, eating and sleeping on altars or cooking meals on top of their tiled roofs. Waters began to recede only slowly from the 13th day of the fifth month, right? So it lasts over 10 days. Enterprising boat owners operated ad hoc taxis during the flood, shuttling residents to and from their homes and the market. Uh, whereas porters and sedan chair bearers understood the conventions for navigating crowded narrow streets and negotiating right of way in normal times, um, during the flood, there was no such understanding for boats flying the now flooded streets. And so these makeshift water taxis reportedly are crashing into other boats, crashing into homes and damaging buildings. Particularly hard hit was uh, Bao Hua Pong uh, and neighboring streets. Uh, right here, which you can see just, you know, along these canals, right? So the water just come along the canals and then flood, um, flood the streets at the end of the canals or along the canals, right? Um, this neighborhood previously suffered early summer floods in 1880 and 1881. In 1885, this area became a setting for sensational stories. On the 18th day of the fifth month, uh, Tun Wan Ya Bo reported that while skiffs were still transporting residents in much of Xiguan, uh, so sort of small boats, in one area, wealthy households hired flower boats and passenger barges to anchor in front of their homes. Family members all slept and ate on board, basically making a party out of a calamity, right? Because they could afford to do so. Shan Bao reported that members of one family at Bao Hua Feng uh, thought nothing of it when a, a straw container floated in the flooded street in front of their house. As it approached their home, an armed robber hiding underneath revealed himself, threatened them into submission, and then used the container to make off with the loot. So in these sensational stories, normal life is being upended in some ways, and yet existing social hierarchies and social problems are being revealed. Right? Uh, finally, the new medium of newspapers reported on relief measures carried out by the IU Shantong or the IU Charitable Hall, um, a pioneering institution in Guangzhou founded in the 1860s, so it's very recently, by prominent merchants. So now we see a merchant uh, run a charitable organization, right, coming to the fore in flood relief. All right. Another kind of natural disaster associated with the wet season was jufeng, uh, or violent winds. In Cantonese descriptions, jufeng uh, encompassed a range of strange or unusual windstorms characterized by high force and shifting directions. Uh, a detailed account in the 1835 Nanhai County Gazetteer provides this typology, which I'm not even, I haven't dared to try to uh, unpack and associate Qingdong or Chiryo or Honglong with particular, uh, you know, scientific phenomena uh, in English, right? Um, maybe in the future. Uh, in his diary, uh, the Hunan native Guo Song Tao, again emphasizing the strangeness of the place, related what one of his subordinates, a Jiangxi native serving as a county magistrate in Guangdong, said about Jufeng. It's a specific kind of sudden or strong wind, and rain found in Guangdong. It arises in a certain direction, but then in an instant might turn in any direction. 
leaves a residual air lasting for two or three days or more before ending and returning to the direction in which it began. Uh, and then either Gua or his interlocutor, oh, I'm not quite sure, I think Gua, um, but it really doesn't matter because the, it's either someone from Hunan or Jiangxi, it's not someone from Guangdong, uh, says that this is related to the sea air. It's different from the interior provinces, right? So it's different from Hunan and Jiangxi, right? It's typical for Guangdong, this unfathomable place. In Chinese accounts, Jufang are usually recorded as occurring in late summer and autumn, concentrated in the sixth, seventh, and eighth months. Most, but not all, descriptions of damage brought by Jufeng map onto what we would call typhoons, and contemporary English language accounts usually use this term. Chinese sources already categorize Jufeng violent winds as unusual or strange, but within this already strange category, Chinese observers describe particular storms in the mid and late 19th century as unprecedented, right? So the strange winds seemed to be getting stranger in the mid and late 19th century. Uh, one Jufeng that I feel confident classifying as a typhoon occurred in 1862 uh, on the first day of the seventh lunar month. Uh, the local academy director and literatus, Shi Chung, reported over 10,000 people injured and countless buildings destroyed and boats sunk. The 1872 Nanhai Gazetteer records in addition to level ground being flooded for several chur, uh, such oddities as a large ocean going ship lifted onto the roof of a building in a market and a firmly secured three Zhang Hai, so over 30 feet high, uh, memorial stone arch in front of the Ye family shrine being uprooted. City residents were unnerved throughout the rest of the typhoon season amidst rumors that a Jufeng would strike again in the eighth month. So Cantonese accounts stressed the unprecedented force of the 1862 typhoon. Shi Trung drew on the memory of elderly informants to determine that they had never witnessed a typhoon of such magnitude. Compilers of the 1872 Gazetteer compared the 1862 typhoon to two Jufeng that occurred 14 years earlier in 1848 in the eighth and ninth months, storms that themselves had capsized thousands of boats. So the Gazetteer writers in 1872 say, people said that the 1848 typhoons were on a scale not experienced for a century. And yet the Gazetteer compilers asserted the 1862 typhoon was even worse, right? So in 1848, they said, wow, never seen anything like this. 1862, they're saying that's even worse, right? So the the idea that these observers have is that things are getting more and more unprecedented, right? Or less and less precedent. Uh, Cantonese observers struggled to make sense of these strange winds, uh, this unprecedented event in 1862. Two months after the 1862 storm, the Shuai Tong Academy uh, made it a topic of its periodic examinations. Examinees were invited to compose a tetrasyllabic ancient style poem on the theme, sighing about the seventh month, Zhu Feng. Separately, Shi Chong, answering the Guangzhou prefect's question about how such an unprecedented storm had occurred, said, heaven was angry. Not a specific God, uh, but uh, heaven, right. Um, so heaven was angry. Uh, he then elaborated, heaven and earth are to humankind as father and mother are to a child. Uh, the child is disobedient, the parent's anger accumulates, and is eventually released in rage. So sure presents the typhoon as a kind of warning to people in the present age. Right? If the 1862 typhoon resulted from general heavenly anger about the current state of people in Guangzhou, an 1878 windstorm was even more discriminating or far more discriminating, I should say. Although some Chinese accounts called it a jufeng, and some English accounts, a typhoon, the narrow path of terrible destruction, its short duration, its occurrence in spring, and some English language descriptions of it as a whirlwind align this storm more with a tornado than a typhoon. Uh, the first part of the day, the ninth day of the third month, 
had typical weather for late spring, right? Heavy rain at noon, followed by clearing. But then there was a hailstorm after that, which uh, indicated something more ominous. In mid-afternoon, a roaring wind blew a cloud of debris across White Goose Pool at the confluence of the trunk of the Pearl River that flows eastward and a branch that flows southward toward Macau. So right here, this is the Macau Passage, goes down to Macau, and then the Pearl River goes down uh, toward uh, Macau. Um, so that's what happened there. Um, and so uh, the storm cut, cut across Xiamen, uh, depicted on the right, uh, on a map included in the United States Consular Correspondence, which Nathan Ferris analyzes in his Architectural History of Guangzhou. Uh, the wind proceeded northward through the heart of Xiguan, striking such streets as Bao Huafeng, uh, then veering to the west to hit Pantang before dissipating, right? So, like this pool across Xiamen, right through the heart of Xiguan, and then kind of veering off uh, toward the west, and then dissipates. Right? Um, the storm caused at least two major fires as it passed, toppling buildings uh, in which people were cooking. So destruction on the river was widespread with hundreds of boats capsized. But on lands, accounts stressed the narrow focus of destruction. One Brit British resident of Xiamen was, quote, struck by the peculiarly sharp line drawn by the whirlwind. For on one side of a very narrow street, the houses stood uninjured. Uh, and the, uh, and the other houses were simply a mass of rubbish or if standing were rendered uninhabitable. Chinese newspapers accounts provide detailed lists of streets within the narrow path of destruction. Uh, one story embellished with such details as the storm turned down this street or turned down that street, uh, arrived atop the home of the pond surname and entered the Xu family shrine, right? So it's almost like a, a walking tour of the city, right? Cantonese locals, the Chinese press, and foreign accounts all depicted the storm as an uncommon disaster, a disaster not seen in several hundred years, uh, one of unprecedented violence. Shen Bao shocked its readers with a specially strange phenomenon, as it said, uh, caused by the storm, intruding on sacred and domestic space. So for example, a centuries old large fir tree flew through the air to Hua Lin Monastery. A small boat flew onto the dew platform, so the balcony of the upper floor of the inner quarters of a residence on one street, and a large bed with quilts and pillows intact uh, flew and alighted on the roof of a shoe store in another street. Right, so we've got you know, uh, things intruding into domestic space and then things being lifted from domestic space and moved to uh, the marketplace, right? Uh, estimates of the number of lives lost vary dramatically from hundreds to over 10,000. Uh, however much, loss of life was significant enough that in the following days, residents fought the stench of decaying bodies by holding sandalwood or the ends of their cues over their noses or by burning incense. Literate male elites writing in conventional genres and in the new medium of newspapers highlighted the narrow path of destruction that to them, seemed to target the notorious parts of Xi Guan. Uh, Sher Chung first observed that the storm was truly a rarely seen singular disaster. Uh, he then noted that most of those harmed and killed were prostitutes, criminals, and foolish base people. Not too many literati uh, from Sher Chung's perspective, right? Um, amidst the panic, it was as if someone were silently pulling the strings, right? This is not something that was randomly done, right? So Shi Chung thus characterized the victims of this uh, extremely freakish seasonal calamity as people somehow deserving punishment, right? One of the streets that suffered most from the storm was Hong Anli, which is not far east of Bao Huafeng. Hong Anli was the site of one of the fires that broke out during the mid afternoon storm, and the fire here burned until 11 p.m., uh, destroying dozens of bays of structures. Uh, Hong Anli was notorious for its brothels, and thus it is unsurprising that the fire reported, reportedly broke out in one of them, conceivably from a stove preparing food or drink for customers. In the disaster's aftermath, officials took advantage to clean up the street. 
right? Clean up the neighborhood. Shun Bao published a prohibition issued by the Guangzhou prefect on the orders of provincial officials, right? And it sort of said, Hong An Li is an iniquitous neighborhood with brothels packed together, among which any remaining space was dedicated to gambling halls or opium dens. This all despite repeated prohibitions by uh, we officials, right? But now we have encountered the wind disaster of the ninth day of the third month, toppling many buildings in the area of Hong An Li, turning the neighborhood into a space filled with rubble. So how did this happen? Well, filth accumulated and perversity smoldered, ultimately incurring the wrath of heaven, right? Now the officials have deputed subordinates to survey the site, open up the streets, distribute aid to disaster victims, and issue this proclamation to the effect that anyone who rebuilds here must not continue to run brothels, gambling halls, or opium dens. And you can imagine how this worked. <laughs> um, those who do so will have their property confiscated and used for such things as meeting the expenses of the IU Shantung, this new charitable organization run by merchants. Um, right, so you can see um, kind of channeling uh, the disaster and trying to change the neighborhood out of that, right? This is a theme that I find repeatedly for this era, right? From official or male elite perspectives, seasonal disasters such as floods, windstorms, and especially fires were cleansing mechanisms providing opportunities to rebuild in acceptable ways, right? And this process, as you can imagine, often entailed uh, relocating socially marginal segments of the population from potentially prime urban real estate, right? And it resonates with what uh, we see in contemporary cities, like uh, people who studied fire in Edo and uh, Chicago, for example, talk about kind of, you know, uh, gentrifying or industrializing neighborhoods after fires. Right? The flip side of naming of deserving targets for destruction in events like the 1878 windstorm was the depiction of miraculous sparing of worthies from destruction, especially in fires. And so I'll just give you uh, one example here from the dry season. In its account of the 1882 New City fire, after tracing the multiple paths of destruction, Sun Wan Yat Bo recounted how the fire spared the home belonging to descendants of the early 19th century scholar, Lin Bo Tong, uh, the lone surviving structure on the first section of Gaudi Street. Right? So this is the new walled city here. Uh, the fire basically occurred right outside the South Gate, uh, Gaudi Street is here, this is only the first section right there, right? Um, so the descendants of Lin Bo Tong, their home was the only one on this street or this section of the street spared. The article then explained that in life, Lin had morally cultivated himself and that posthumously his students had unsuccessfully attempted to have the state enshrine Lin as a local worthy. That his home was spared led people to see it as recompense for his moral accomplishments. And so this, I don't have proof, but this surely was impetus for renewed efforts, this time successful. Uh, the governor of Guangdong in, in 1883 memorial uh, recommended enshrinement of Lin as a local worthy. And in 1884, the Board of Rights approved it. And so Lin was enshrined as a local worthy. Um, and his worthiness was demonstrated by his house having been spared uh, during this awful fire. Okay, so um, I began by saying this is kind of a project in search of an argument. So um, I can't quite leave you with an argument or at least not one that I'm confident will transform the field. Um, but I'm trying to convey a sense of lived experience uh, during the wet season, especially uh, today. Um, and uh, to give a sense of uh, the alternation of wet and dry seasons as one of the main rhythms of urban life uh, and with an emphasis on urban, right? So it's not just rural life that is shaped by seasonal change, but also urban life, right? Even urban life as the city is industrializing, right? So uh, if we turn to the dry season and fires, one reason scholars think that fires get worse uh, in the late 19th century is the use of kerosene lamps, right? So this is the result of industrialization, but it's kind of feeding into seasonal hazards, right? Um, so even in an industrializing city, seasons fundamentally shaped urban life, at least in the 19th century. I also hope to reveal something about how locals navigated the wet season and how outsiders viewed it, right? So in assessing calamities, um, locals might emphasize unusual times, 
but outsiders like Guo Songtao dwelled on Guangdong as an unusual place, right? That's how they explained it. So Kenya thinks it's like, this is unprecedented. We've never seen anything like this in several hundred years. Guo Songtao would say, this is a weird place, right? Um, so it's kind of different. I also, um, I'm trying to convey a sense that local observers in the 19th century had that this, these uh, seasonal calamities in the mid, well, throughout the 19th century, really, but increasing over the course of the 19th century, were unprecedented in nature, right? So things seem to be getting worse, right? Um, their explanations tend to focus on such things as general extravagance or, uh, you know, the um, uh, evil customs of particular neighborhoods, right? And when uh, they focused their criticism on particular groups, it was marginal groups, right? Prostitutes, uh, sort of unattached uh, male laborers, underemployed male laborers and such, right? So um, instead of a conclusion, I might say, I'm in search of a conclusion and I'm having trouble saying that, uh, you know, the 1822 fire that destroyed Xiguan, or the 1882 fire in the new city, or the 1833 flood in the old city, or the 1885 flood in Xiguan, uh, put Guangzhou on a new historical path. Um, that said, uh, these disasters do seem to accelerate some trends, such as the dilapidation of the Banner Garrison, uh, such as the emergence of gentry led institutions in the early 19th century and merchant-led institutions in the late 19th century. And um, I haven't quite done that today, but I think that in, if, I, if you look at uh, crimes that are committed uh, and uh, more specific kind of local social uh, controversies uh, in the aftermath of these disasters, uh, the disasters uh, re to reveal, they provide moments that allow us to see social hierarchies and social struggles play. So um, in lieu of a conclusion, then I'll ask you to uh, give me your advice and suggestions, and I look forward to hearing your feedback. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so we'll open it up to questions now, and we do have um, a few people who've joined us online, but we're going to open up the questions for people here first, and then um, um, allow us people who are joining us online to unmute themselves and also ask questions. So we'll uh, put your question in the chat Q&A. Okay. Oh, questions for Q&A. Okay. And maybe introduce yourself when you ask a question. Oh, I'm Michelle Howell, I'm a Thank you very much for that review. Uh, I'm sure about these local charitable institutions. Mm -hmm. played a very big role in the transfer of Japanese and Japanese. Um, so I think it's conventionally in the that these local charitable institutions arise around after the Japanese founding, especially in the Japanese area. Mm -hmm. And there's some like research that showing that actually come from China that. Uh, Became much earlier, maybe in the Asian century, you had already, you already had all of the farmers in the local region. I was wondering in the Guangzhou case, will you see how many people timeline here? Like when you when you see maybe these kind of uh, either gentry led or merchant led or they seem prominent. In the sort of the uh, that's really the, uh, the and how did that change over the course of the Yeah, so um, the article you're referring to, I assume, is the one that draws heavily on the Ba County archives, right? Um, there is, well, to my knowledge, there is no non high county or Plan High County archives. Um, so I don't have that kind of source. Uh, and the sources that I do see um, would align. Not so much with that article, but with more recent scholarship that sort of pushes the timeline into the early 19th century. So uh, Han Xiong and people like that. Um, so what I see uh, is the 18th century seems to be, in Guangzhou at least, seems to be largely official organized charity, right? So you have you know, the 
the widow's home and the leper's home and that kind of thing, right? Um, and then in the early 19th century, you begin to have uh, what I would call gentry-led institutions and then late 19th century merchant-led institutions, right? But again, you know, I have, you know, uh, 1G, gazetteers, um, some central government archives, right? Um, so, you know, memorials from provincial officials. Um, I have genealogies, um, but I don't have county level archives that might reveal that kind of an earlier precedent. So from what I see, I would say, uh, gentry-led institutions in Guangzhou are not a result of the Taiping Rebellion. I mean, the Taiping Rebellion didn't really impact Guangzhou. The Triad Rebellion <laughs> impacted Guangzhou more than the Taiping Rebellion, right? Um, but even not, not that much, right? The, the Triads never actually took Guangzhou. Um, so, um, I see gentry-led institutions being an early 19th century phenomenon, um, continuing through the mid-century, but then you also see the emergence of merchant-led institutions in 1860s, 1870s, and then increasingly uh, into the Republican era. Um, so I guess my, my, in short, my findings would align with the moderate revisionists, I suppose, um, but I don't, I don't see that for the 18th century. But again, I mean, uh, the author herself pointed out uh, or pose the question himself, right? Is it that uh, Chengdu, or not Chengdu, sorry, Chongqing was different? Or can we just see this in Chongqing and we can't see it elsewhere because we don't have so many county archives elsewhere? I don't know. Yeah, good question. Okay, thank you for the wonderful talk. Uh, I'm assistant professor here at ALP. I teach more science literature. Mm -hmm. um, I'm wondering about the periodization. So um, I'm curious because the choice of 19th century mm -hmm. uh, is peculiar for me because I was wondering if from written records and from other evidences, if the sensibility or the kind of experience of climate catastrophe or uh, like excessive rain is qualitatively different from other times. Mm -hmm. And I ask this because um, I know in history there there has been a rising kind of trend or uh, attitude, I mean, of paying more attention to the larger climate. Mm -hmm. Among these are, you know, the late Ming being corresponding to the little ice age right. and how that uh, you know, so I was wondering what is special about this particular uh, time yeah. um, and you made the space quite sort of distinctive I mean I'm Cantonese so <laughs> <laughs> it's uh it's, it's really wonderful to actually have like a larger view of, of, of the time but also the space so I'm just wondering yeah so um the rain I'll have to plead ignorance because I just I haven't looked at uh rain patterns to see if there's more rain uh, in the 19th century than there was in the 18th and 17th and 16th. Um, for flooding, uh, I largely accept and draw on the work of Robert Marx, who's written this economic, uh, ecological um, history of Lingnan region, so Guang, Dong and Guangxi. Uh, and so you know, he, he ends his book by basically saying uh, the Lingnan macro region has reached its uh, breaking point right before the Opium War, right? So actually the environment, environmental history is more important than uh, right, this political history of the Opium War. Um, and, you know, I do uh, largely accept, I'm not an expert in uh, economic history or environmental history, uh, but it seems convincing to me that, um, you know, denuded uh, hillsides and the silting creating such problems. So the flooding in Guam in the Provo River Delta is largely a result of diking of rivers, reclaiming of sand, so basically, um, land is just land is expanded by really you know building it out into the sea, right? And then this makes uh, riverways more narrow, which backs up uh, the water, right? Um, so I do, I the flooding that makes sense that it's worse uh, in the 19th century um, or it reached a crisis point in the early 19th century. The uh, freshets, right? Uh, the flooding from the west and north rivers. Uh, rain, I don't really know about. Um, by way of explanation, I guess what I would say is that uh, the reason I'm focusing on the 19th century is I want to understand um, 
how the city worked and I want to understand how people experience the city, right? Um, so I'm choosing the 19th century because it's so well documented. Um, I'm personally, I'm, I'm not interested in, the, I'm not so much interested in the Republican or uh, communist period. Um, I'm more interested in the imperial period, the late imperial period. So I don't want to go into the 20th century. So uh, the 19th seems like a good place because it's so well documented. Uh, it has both you know, foreign observers and uh, Chinese uh, accounts as well. It doesn't have a county archive, or really wish it did. Um, so I, I thought about working on uh, Chongqing, actually, but I, I think now is probably not a good time to work on Chongqing because so many people <laughs> are working on Chongqing. Um, and I know a lot about Guangdong anyway. So uh, I've chosen the 19th century primarily because it's so well documented. It's the best documented part of the imperial era <laughs> for this city that I like to study. Um, but I do think that uh, the people who were living through it saw it as an unprecedented age and saw the fire disasters and flood disasters as unprecedented, right? Um, so uh, I guess what I'm kind of trying to do a little bit of social history, a little bit of cultural history. Um, I'm probably a little more comfortable doing it in culture. And so uh, I'm more confident saying people perceive things <laughs> That's getting worse. I'm a little less confident in saying things are definitely getting worse. I guess you know. the reason why I ask this, uh, now I remember what really uh, mm -hmm. like, well, reminded me of this, is because if you look at the reasoning, especially the moral reasoning mm -hmm. or moral interpretation of why this happened or the way they ask the question, right? It, it's a question about why. Why here and why now? Mm -hmm. right? And the explanation they offer is very much the same. Uh, with medieval times, mm. with classical ethics, right? It's because heaven is angry. Mm -hmm. It's because uh, this particular group, I guess the particularization of uh, class, it's something that I see is quite interesting and, and, and different. Like I probably, I don't know, I don't know enough. Maybe, um, what, what period do you focus on? I focus on time and song, okay. so earlier period. Um, mm -hmm. But I see this uh, sort of targeting the marginal groups. Uh, for me, this is, is relatively. Mm -hmm. So I don't know, like, in terms of explanation, interpretation of uh, catastrophe, and in terms of ethics, sensibility, is there any significant difference in 18th century? Because considering all the sort of influences from outside, whether or not that makes any difference in the way people perceive climate and how it relates to human uh, morale society. But. Yeah, so um, the, the influence, the, the outside influence, that becomes a factor. So uh, these kinds of writings after the Opie Moore will sort of add that in as another uh, uh, example of unprecedented times. Right, so um, losing a war to these people, um, and you know having them dictate terms of interaction—that's another example of the way in which things are being unprecedented. Um, I don't see that so much before the Opium War. So um, there's certainly an awareness of foreign things, um, but it's not problematized so much. Opium, I guess, is, but aside from opium, right? You know, um, blacks is not problematized, right? And certain kinds of uh, uh, you know, culinary influences are not problematized, et cetera. Um, so, yeah, I think, I mean, I think what we have is um, old cliches being applied to new social realities, right? And at least in Guangzhou, right? I mean, um, I won't comment on the Jiangnan region and elsewhere, but um, certainly um, this much money um, is uh, something, and this much extravagance uh, is certainly unique, at least to 18th and 19th century Guangzhou compared to earlier times in Guangzhou. Uh, this um, uh, an overgrown city, uh, I think, is unique to uh, the 19th century, perhaps the, early, the uh, late 18th century as well. Other questions? Yeah. So, uh, I kind of want to ask: Do you think these 
uh, scenarios where the local officials use these uh, excellent techniques as uh, almost like windows for proposing global reforms, mm -hmm. especially in the case where they condemn the quantities and all the lower class residents mm -hmm. and uh, use this, use the tornado as an opportunity to try to get rid of them. Do you think this can be an indicator of a continuous pattern of the state trying to suppress these? Or do you think it can actually be an indicator of the lack of other effective means of imposing social reform by the officials? That they have to use this as precious opportunities by the commander heaven to actually implement their moralizing attitude. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good question. Um... First, I should point out, uh, it, it seems like even the opportunity uh, provided by the 1878 tornado was not enough because if you read, if you believe Shun Bao, you know, a few years later, Hong Anli was once again, uh, you know, a, a, a neighbor red light district, basically, right? Um, so it didn't seem to work. Uh, some fires do seem to work, and it's not the state that's taking the lead so much, but rather the state allowing local petitioners to change a neighborhood, right? So there's um, the 1882 fire. Fires seem more effective, actually, than floods in changing neighborhoods, right? Um, so in the 1882 fire, the aftermath of it, um, this one group of residents of one street, they're living in you know, a permanent, uh, probably shop slash homes, um, petitioned to remove uh, basically land-dwelling boat people from this kind of marginal area along the Pearl River in the aftermath of fire. And they said they blame the fire spreading so quickly on them, right? And they live in these ramshackle homes, easily flammable, too many of them, too concentrated, et cetera, et cetera. So um, we petitioned the state to not allow them to rebuild here, right? And instead we're gonna open it up as a commercial street, right? So from what I've seen, that kind of initiative seems to be more successful when, um, the officials acquiesce to initiatives of wealthy, powerful local residents, right? So it's not so much the state, the state doesn't seem to succeed just when the state wants to do something, but the state seems to succeed when it simply acquiesces to powerful locals getting what they want, right? Uh, were the foreigners uh, doing any meteorological reporting uh, that might be an independent source of tracking? Yeah. Um, a paper on Wuhan a few mm -hmm. years ago, which they were, I was going to say, but foreigners are from Goma, of course. Right. Um, possibly. So I, you know, I've seen, um, I see kind of small slices of time recorded, right? So, um, you know, foreign reports on specific typhoons will mention, you know, the air pressure, right? Um, how that changes before and after the typhoon. And, um, but I haven't yet found, but I haven't really systematically looked for a record that would show this over a very long period of time. Um, I, mean, I wonder where where I would look for that. Mm. Uh, in terms of rain and floods here in California, of course. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, at least we used to have a very pronounced seasonality of fire. Right, that was yeah. <laughs> right. But, yeah. Uh, perhaps less so. Uh, if you can, uh, probably, I don't know. Uh, right. Or uh, uh, is there any sense they have that there's fire season that has to go first? In foreign accounts? Well, and... oh, absolutely. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Um, because, you know, uh, most of it will be anecdotal, right? But, you know, those, so they, they mentioned the building of uh, my information on the, on the structure largely comes from foreign accounts and foreign photographs, right? Uh, so foreign observers are more likely to point out, to describe just what the city looks like, right? And how it's changing and how it changes with the seasons, right? Um, so I've used a lot of uh, 
you know, the kind of the foreign journals like Chinese Repository. Um, I haven't yet got into like the archives of companies. So perhaps archives of companies might have records that extend over long periods of time. What I also need to, I guess if I really want to take the social history approach, I need to do some work on the 18th century, right? Um, because I myself have been critical of work that's looked at, uh, you know, uh, one snippet of time in the early 19th century, uh, you get uh, information from um, archival sources or gazetteers and say, well, this is a particularly violent time. But then, well, <laughs> what if, I'll believe you if you can show me, you know, compared to a 10 year stretch of time, 50 years earlier, uh, maybe I'll believe you that this is one more violent. But if you just show me information from the early 19th century, it's hard to tell, right? Um, so I need, I guess I'll need to do some work on the 18th century. And I suppose that the company archives would be the place to look. Uh, I'm just starting now to explore um, non-Chinese archives. So in fact, um, after today, I'll eventually, uh, on Monday and Tuesday, I'll be doing work in Nashville uh, at the Southern Baptist Historical Library and Archive because uh, there's someone who was based in uh, Guangzhou and has this whole case of uh, correspondence uh, from 1857 through the 1880s. And so I'm hoping he's going to mention the fire and flood. Uh, so I need to do some work to be able to make the social history argument uh, or the, the environmental history argument. Yeah, I don't know at this point. Yeah. Yeah. I have a really simple question. Um, where are the scholars in, in, in your in America, or the flowers, the flowers, yeah. If we think the disasters, isn't that uh, the reduce of uh, problems in higher hierarchy that you're describing that they are unprecedented, becoming more serious, you are finding things like flowers in one's own view, the uh, sort of the, uh, the opposite of um, natural disasters that also follows the season, mm -hmm. that, yeah. Uh, Flowers in quantity being right. blended and yep. varied by both people. Yep. So, yep. Mm -hmm. Flowers in spring and in the summer. And in winter. I mean, uh, chrysanthemums, yeah. Right. Right. Yep. Or literary favorites. And, yep. Uh, that I don't, that there seem to be no social problems uh, coming out of those, those uh, interactions between different classes of people doing. What, what, what flowers uh, in festivals in which flowers present. And, uh, uh, yeah. yeah. So, where, if you're asking where the flowers are in my project, uh, the flowers are all in a file, <laughs> right? Uh, together with, yeah, together with uh, information on excursions, right? So, and I guess also with festivals, right? So, one, I'm thinking in terms of pairs of chapters. So I'm thinking one pair of chapters would be people coming into work and people going out to play. Um, so, you know, when do people come in? When do people go out? Um, so flowers would be in the excursion chapter. And of course, excursions to Huadi, this uh, suburb across the Pearl River uh, that's known for having nurseries, basically, right? So they're commercialized nurseries and, um, you know, it's, throughout all the diaries that I used, right? Um, you're going to Huadi. Typically, actually, Huadi seems to be actually, a. I haven't, my sense is, I haven't actually got the statistics yet, but my sense is you go to Huadi in the winter, actually, not in the summer and the spring. Uh, you go in the winter for chrysanthemums um, and maybe, you know, traveling across the Pearl River uh, in summer is a little hot, right? So in, in, uh, in the fifth month, you go to, uh, Li Wan and you eat lychees, right? Um, and uh, then in uh, winter, you go to Huadi uh, and you um, purchase flowers, right? Um, but flowers are also involved in festivals as well. And so I've got another file where I'm just <laughs> collecting information on festivals. So the one problem with this project is um, my sources and my topics aren't neatly aligned, right? So I would go through a diary, for example, and uh, you know this snippet of information in weather, this snippet in riots, this snippet in flowers, right? And then I go through um, 
know, a foreign missionary's account and I find little information, some goes here, some goes there, some goes there, right? And then I just put it away <laughs> and I haven't, I haven't written it up yet, right? So flowers are certainly there. Um, I would suspect that flowers aren't completely free of social problems. We just don't see those social problems in the writings of literati who write about flowers, right? As long as they're getting their flowers <laughs> uh, on time, uh, it's fine, right? Uh, and you might see, you know, the, the author of a diary talking about interacting with a boatman on his way over to Huadi. Um, but, you know, we don't hear the boatman's voice. Boatman might be complaining about this uh, pompous literatus uh, riding his boat, not paying him enough. I mean, who knows, right? Um, so, there may be a dark underside even to flowers. I don't know. Maybe the pies, if you have any pies, even if they don't, I mean, even if in poetry they talk about the same thing, diary, then. Yeah, there are there is mention of prices. Um, the problem is, is it enough to create something really um, substantial to make it? But I certainly definitely do see prices mentioned, and um, you know, when the price is mentioned in a diary, presumably it's because it was either expensive, unusually expensive, or unusually cheap, right? Um, if it's just the standard price, then which I imagine they don't, the diarist doesn't often mention the price, right? Um, so that's kind of a problematic, diaries are problematic in that sense, I guess, when you're trying to get at uh, social history. Right? Mm -hmm. Yes, there's a question. Hi, well, um, thank you for our presentation. You can say, oh, first year PhD. Yes. So uh, I think this question might be a little bit too simple, but I'll try to phrase it in the sense that from what I've heard from a conversation with everyone else, and also from, from presentation, it feels to me that these local gentry that you're talk, talking about the like disaster in use or disaster motive and phrases. But I'm not sure whether how are they being disaster in use. Like, like, like before that, are they already entrenched, already very powerful? And because of the disaster, they have more ways to make themselves even more influential and more powerful. Or there's just simply no change. Especially, I like mm -hmm. the part when I'm talking about this, talk about like the rise of merchant class. So, is it because of the disaster that this merchant class, you know, have that new way, have that yeah. reasons to go and, yes, I can, I can use this to increase my influence or increase my, you know, my, right. my take in this entire region? Or well, it's just, they yeah, already entrenched, and after this, they're just more entrenched. That's not much. Yeah, that's a good question. So, um, I was careful to say we see the rise of merchant led institutions, not to say we see the rise of a merchant class. And the reason I'm careful about that is because for Pearl River Delta Society, at least, I just do not buy the idea that there was a gentry class and then a merchant class for those, because I would challenge anyone to. Um, show me uh, a purely gentry family in the Pearl River Delta in the year 1800. I mean, maybe you could show me one, but for every one you show me, I think I could show you 10 uh, that have both merchants and gentry in it, <laughs> right? Um, so I don't really see a purely original gentry class in Guangdong that's then um, replaced by uh, merchant class. I do see um, a powerful discourse of you know, merchants, uncouth merchants, right? A critique of uncouth merchants, um, but that's usually targeting not merchants generally, but two specific kinds of merchants: the maritime merchants, the coal merchants, and salt merchants. So merchants that are super wealthy, much wealthier than the gentry critics <laughs> can ever hope to be, and they control, they own all of the nice things that the gentry would like to see and use, right, and own themselves, right? So, um, uh, so it's not so much, a, it's not so much gentry disturbed by merchants, but it's really kind of, um, Uh, cultural, economic, political elites, uh, critical of socially marginal people, right? And so the elite includes wealthy merchants, right? Um, 
the, the problem, I mean, you see occasional in the 19th century uh, critiques of you know, anti-merchant discourse, but again, that's targeting the super wealthy and that's very targeted. Um, most, the kinds of social categories that are problematized in the writing of male elites are not merchants per se, but really just um, uh, more socially marginal people. So, uh, you know, the rootless, unattached male, the underemployed male, um, women going to monasteries uh, to worship. And in that case, it's usually wealthy women <laughs> going to uh, monasteries to worship. Uh, boat people, um, the Don, right? Uh, so it's it's really not a gentry, gentry merchant divide. Um, institutions is different, right? Only in the late 19th century uh, from 1860s do we see merchant you know, explicitly merchant-led organizations, right? Uh, so that seems to be new. So I have um, one um, question in the Q and A mm -hmm. um, box, but I also, you know, take this prerogative to um, ask a question of my own. Sure. Um, so I was reminded as you were talking about this discourse of. Um, men of power and so forth about um, you know, what's causing these disasters and so forth. I was reminded um, less of kind of the long history of talking about, well, you know, heaven's going to punish people who aren't acting appropriately, and more of this is Toby Meyer Fong's work in her book, What Remains, on the future, mm -hmm. which is essentially contemporary. Right. And it's been a while since I've read that book, but my sense is that she hints that there is something different going on mm -hmm. in the second half of the 19th century mm -hmm. um, and a kind of kind of almost great awakening of kind of new Confucian morality at the mm -hmm. moment. Yeah. Um, in Jiangnan, where she's looking at because of the Taipings and that mm -hmm. kind of destruction. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering right. if you see sort of parallels with that. So rather than a kind of constant, yeah. that there's this moment of a kind of Confucian fundamentalism mm -hmm. um, in the face of 19th century disasters, whether human made or um, weather. So, yeah, I mean, I think that's an angle that you could take. I mean, so, and uh, so some of these, uh, even merchant led charitable organizations, right? Uh, one of their main activities would be uh, sort of, um, was it sort of gathering up scrap paper with writing on it? Right, uh, that kind of thing, and I think Uger was doing one thing. I can't recall. That's Uger's idea, actually. Uh -huh. yeah. Right. Um, so, uh, yeah, I think you probably could uh, make an argument like that, right? Um, and it's again, sort of like it's, in many ways, it's the merchants or people from uh, families, you know, <laughs> that make their money from commerce. Who are leading these arguments often. Yeah. Yeah, I think there might be some kind of um, Neo Confucian revival. And this is kind of a pushback against the early 19th century Shuai Tong agenda in some ways, right? And even the Shuai Tong scholars of the late 19th century are embracing this kind of, you know, Han Song Kia He, right? So the Han learning and Song learning, uh, taking the best from both and blending them. Yeah. Um, yeah. So let me ask for the person who's asked mm -hmm. the Q and A. Um, since they uh, waiting in, uh, one small question. Thanks for your wonderful talk. I really enjoyed it and would love to read the book. The follow up on the sensory experience, flower and the smell of the city. What kind of dialects do people speak in Guangzhou at the time? Were people from different places able to understand each other's dialect? Mm. What did the city sound like? Yeah. Right. Ooh. <laughs> Love to be able to answer that satisfactorily. <laughs> um, so you know, uh, what did the city sound like? It's a tough question, but one of the sources, actually, uh, one of my colleagues in the Division of Communities, <laughs> HKUST, um, works on historical linguistics of Cantonese, and um, this passage actually comes from her database. Of uh, she's created a database of Cantonese dictionaries. Uh, from the 19th century, because she's trying to figure out what Cantonese sounded like uh, at this time, right? So just very broadly, uh, you know, um, most people spoke Cantonese, um, but 
uh, you have this large influx of um, migrants from, you've got uh, uh, salt merchants seem to come from Northern Zhejiang province uh, migrating. You've got uh, Fujian, the, the Kaohong merchants, the maritime merchants, a lot of them have Fujian roots. <laughs> um, the uh, kind of class of administrative specialists, the private secretaries or Muyo that staffed um, agencies, uh, official yamen in Guangzhou and waited in Guangzhou looking for staffing positions throughout Guangdong, right? They're mostly from Northern Zhejiang as well. So if you're walking the streets of Guangzhou, I think you're mainly, you're mainly hearing Cantonese, um, which I mean, to my ear would probably sound pretty similar to Cantonese today. To my colleagues here would probably sound different because uh, she knows Cantonese a heck of a lot better than I do. Um, but you would also hear other languages, right? You'd probably hear a little bit of Fujianese. Uh, if you were near the Fujian Weiguan, um, you would probably hear some uh, Zhejiang, you know, some Shaoxing dialect probably, because this is where most of the, the private secretaries came from. Um, so you'd, real, you'd hear a real mix. You'd hear some Hakka. Uh, so there's, um, uh, aside from Nanhai County, Panyu County and Shunda County, which is just south of Guangzhou, uh, the, larger, the largest producer of degree winners was Jia Ying Department, basically the, the Hakka speaking area of Northeastern Guangdong. You see a lot of Hakkas coming into Guangzhou to um, attend academies, sit for examinations, et cetera, et cetera, right? So within the city of Guangzhou, I think you actually, within the walled city, I think you hear a lot of different dialects. In the Western suburb, you're probably hearing mainly Cantonese. I'm speculating, of course, <laughs> um, but that would be my sense. So um, I wish I knew, it's the short answer. <laughs> Any additional questions? Yeah. Uh, but like, I Similar question uh, this morning. Um, so, in the sources I've used so far, uh, I don't see that. Not to say it doesn't exist. You can imagine that it does exist. Uh, so, the the literati writers I see are mainly just saying this is you know tian tian, right? So, heaven is punishing us. Um, I haven't seen. Uh, being attributed to a particular god. Fires, there's the aspect of fire gods, right? So um, that's a little bit different. So for fires, uh, you'll have sensational stories from Shen Bao and Sun Wen Yat Bo about, um, I think it was, if I recall correctly, um, preceding the 1882 fire, there was a whole, it was a bad fire season. Um, there were uh, reportedly um, <clears throat> somebody had heard a sound on a wall and kind of you know uh, uh, opened the wall to see and some little uh, little boy dressed in red ran out from the wall and ran to the um, Huaguang Temple, I believe it was, right? So a temple kind of associated um, with fire uh, and this was seen as a bad omen, right? Uh, so I think I can pursue that angle for fires but I haven't seen it for windstorms or floods yet. Um, but in general, it could be just the kind of sources I'm reading so far are literati generated sources. And so they're kind of, you know, um, if anything, they're Neo-Confucians, <laughs> right? <laughs> um, and so I'm, I'm, not, I'm just not gonna see that. Surely, like you say, it's easy to imagine that um, sort of 
uh, non-elites are speaking in these terms. Um, I've collected a lot of almanacs and I'm trying to figure out, you know, Guangzhou, almanacs printed in Guangzhou, distributed in Guangzhou during the 19th century. And I'm trying to figure out if I can use those <laughs> in any way, but I haven't quite um, worked through them yet. Yeah. So it seems like a lot of my answers today are, I don't know, but um, it's, um, I don't know, but it's a good question. It's, it's, it's something I'll keep my eye out for. Yeah. Um, maybe on that note, we should thank you again for this really rich talk, and we'll look forward to seeing the project develop. All right, well, thank you very much for this opportunity. I appreciate it.